Welcome to another Out of Spec Reviews video. Welcome to beautiful Southern California and welcome to the Karma GS-6L. That's what happens when you let an engineer name a car. But one thing is for certain, the engineers did not style this thing because look at how gorgeous this is. If you think this is like Fiskars of the past, you would be wrong. This is an updated version with new Karma technology. Fisker is now out of the picture. It is now Karma. And I'm gonna take you on a thorough tour of this car. First, starting with the exterior styling and then we'll go through some intricate bits like the key and some other things then i'll take you through all of the interior spacing and sizing we'll then take it for a drive and then we're going to finish up with the craziest amount of data that i've ever seen from a car i absolutely think it's so cool so strap in it might be a long video it's an impromptu one i didn't know i was going to drive this car until this morning but let's go through a thorough tour of the GS-6L. We're starting and filming this at Karma's headquarters here in Irvine, California. It's my understanding they have two media vehicles, this one and another one in Detroit. So very happy that they invited us to come over. They saw we were in California. They said, you gotta come drive our machine. And that's some confidence right there, I think. So there's some enthusiasts working here because I see an M240i with all the M performance stuff, some modded out Model 3s, other things. So you got, you know, I think it's important to know what people behind this car are driving. And it's also nice to know that they're kind of into cars, at least a, a large percentage judging by the car park. This car is built right here in California, not in this building, but somewhere around here. And that is pretty cool. A lot of people like an American car. Also, the pricing for the GS-6 is interesting. So there's three different trim levels. There's the GS-6, the GS-6L, which is this one, it's like the luxury build, and then the GS-6S, which is the sporty one, and it's actually juiced up a little bit more with more power. When we take this for a drive, I think I'll demonstrate some launch control-y stuff, maybe some tire squealy things, and show you maybe you don't need that much more power. Let's go through options and pricing though, because I had no idea what these even were uh, going for, what these cost until now. To open the trunk, I can grab the key, which is an interesting one. Come on in and take a look at this. So this key is designed with the Karma logo, that right there. There's a, been a few different versions of this over the year. And I imagine you get alarm, trunk, lock, and unlock. And this key shape and design is really nice. The problem is it's just plastic. It weighs nothing. Um, this would be really cool if it was like one solid piece of aluminum. So great design, not so great execution on the key. When you have such a specialty luxury car, I think you need a really special key. But that's just my opinion. Opening the trunk here, forgive some of my camera equipment. We get the biggest window sticker. It wins on window sticker size, that's for sure. And we have some options. This one's VIN 95, base price 93.9. Honestly, not bad considering how exclusive this car is and how many looks it gets on the road. It's got like some wild options, look at this. It's got $10,000 22 inch HRE wheels. Cool, but I would skip that. Also has like carbon fiber and drilled rotors. Anyway, it's got like $10,000 worth of wheels and maybe another $5,000 worth of stuff you don't need. The only option on this car that I think is worthwhile is the blackout package, which gives you all this black trim around here. And on this color, which is Pacifico Gray, a $2,000 color, I think the spec is gorgeous. Really nice spec, non-power trunk, by the way. And you know, from a styling perspective, you guys will have known and seen the Fisker Karma from like 2014, maybe even earlier than that, to be honest. When that car came out, there was a kid in my high school's dad who had one and he used to drive him to school and we all thought it was the coolest thing ever. And uh, the problem with that was, is it drove like crap and it had a GM Ecotec engine that was absolute garbage. So you can pick those up for like 35 to 40 grand all day long used now. And that makes sense because it's really a garbage car. So I came into this with low expectations 
I think it's going to be better than that. Um, then now you have the Karma Rivera, which they've done a run of, and then they did the Rivero GT. That's pretty much done and over. Those cars are gone. And this is going to be their bread and butter, the GS6 or GS-6. Uh, yeah, not sure why they would choose going from like a Rivero to a GS-6L. Pretty, pretty boring name, if I'm honest. Uh, but they did. Let's walk through the Karma's powertrain. Super, super interesting. Under the hood here is a 1.5 liter three cylinder engine. I believe it's the B38 from BMW Group. At least this is what they tell me. They tell me it's the same engine that's in the i8 and the base Mini Cooper. I'm sure there's some tuning differences, but that's a solid engine. We know it's holding up really well in i8, which is a a similar use case platform, but this engine is in no way connected to the drive wheels whatsoever. This is purely connected to a generator, which then charges up the high voltage battery, which then feeds the electric motor. So let's go down here. So up front, you have a power source, which is purely a generator, and they chose the BMW Group three cylinder. Great engine, great choice, sounds really good. To close the hood, you rest it on its latches, one side down, the next side down over here that's it no slamming really easy I love a reverse open hood then we get to some adding of the fuel sources you have your fuel cap it says it re requires 91 octane and that's just like a regular you know is it <laughs> it's just a normal fuel cap right there except you got to spin it a lot more than normal that's actually pretty funny and then you get to the electric bits which this is where you put electricity into and you have a CCS charging port. So J1772 and CCS for DC fast charging. We're gonna take it over to a DC fast charger and just see what kind of charging power we can get later on in this video. But I'll tell you already, this little protective cap is a pain to get on the CCS port. I really, look, it's supposed to fit into these holes and I swear, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get this thing to go back in. Um, let's just close it, someone else's problem. Our problem later on so uh, that's how you fill everything up essentially you have the the engine which powers the generator which then charges the battery pack like i mentioned it's a 28 kilowatt hour battery pack it's a 400 volt system architecture it has huge discharge rate by the way because uh 28 kilowatt hours isn't that much but for the power this car makes it does output a ton of power and um yeah, that seems cool. Then you have two electric motors in the back, which are totally independently connected. So torque vectoring on the rear. So each rear wheel gets its own motor. In terms of power and stuff, I actually don't know offhand. I'll put it here in the bottom, but uh, what matters is what it feels like to drive. So we'll take it for a drive and I'll show you how it drives. Hey, Alyssa, why don't you show us what's going on in the back seat? So the, the door handles are interesting because it's a squeeze on the inside. Nothing on the outside actually moves. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Hop on in there. Uh, you don't think you can? Seat in. Okay, oh, so right. not much rear seat room. Go ahead, let's put the front seat forwards. Okay. So you have a manual keyhole. That's yeah. interesting. You have power seats, nice controls on those power seats, by the way. The lumbar is this control right here it's just in and out not up and down so you've moved the seat up you probably could still sit in the front seat like this you're pretty tall yeah it's got a lot of footwell a lot of footwell okay, okay. so it's got this big thing in the middle that's so your battery pack your battery pack so it, it's um you never have to touch this person which is nice. <laughs> right. um, it's got Window controls? Window controls and heated seats. Oh, nice. But no, there's cooling seats up there and heated. So it's just heated in the back. Right. And, and little cup holders. Little cup holders and a little... Thing but no just... center armrest storage, right? Which makes sense because that's your battery pack. And this is how you get out of the car. You just push this little button. Which I like. You like that. Cool. And how else is the back seat headroom wise? No sunroof in this car. Just an Alcantara headliner. You also have some lights up above there to your left? Uh, yeah, they, they're not LEDs. Oh, they're not? No, I don't believe so. No, yeah, just, uh, uh, maybe they're, they are LEDs, just uh, colored to be a warmer temperature. Yeah, maybe. But how's the headroom? Uh, 
it's it's pretty good. I think if I were to hit a bump, I'd I'd, I'd bump my head. And how back. tall are you? Uh, five ten. Five ten. So anyone really over six feet, it's going to be a struggle back there, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Yeah, but that's really for a pinch. Yeah. Really in a pinch. And uh, cool. Well, thanks for showing us the back seat. Jumping inside. Fairly easy to get in and out of. Let's turn this on to get the AC. It's toasty out today. The car is indicating 109 degrees Fahrenheit. Also sitting in the sun. Seatbelt on just in case it dings. And music off. I actually don't know if there's another volume button other than this one here on the steering wheel, which sometimes goes off and sometimes doesn't. I don't know. Volume button right in the corner. Oh, this right here. Interesting. So that's how you do it. So uh, we'll go through the infotainment towards the end of this video because I'd love to show you all of these gauges and everything. But let's talk about interior vibe, feel, build quality, and how everything is arranged. Uh, right off the bat, this gives me Aston Martin repeat vibes early Aston Martin Rapide vibes, almost like it feels just like a 2010 Aston Martin Rapide in that I think it feels a bit old. And maybe that's to do with the leather on the inside and the smell. It's all, you know, leather and everything. It's nice to be in here, but it's pretty tight. So uh, plenty of room for the driver, not so much knee room to sprawl out. And the seats are pretty firm, but you can see here we have a huge center console going through the entire car. And that's because this is where your battery is. And what this means is your cup holders are pretty shallow. So I'll take my typical Starbucks drink, watch how much it goes in. Not that much, but it holds it in pretty well. Uh, we were taking some turns when this was even filled up more and uh, was pretty good at that, I would say. I'd say that, that worked. Um, your storage in here, if you take a look, is pretty shallow as well. Again, this is very similar to like Volvo plug-in hybrids that put the, va the battery pack here. This is just a little bit wider. And when I say it feels like an older car, like the Aston Repeat, I mean like the squeaks and rattles. You, there's a couple rattles coming from over here. F hear all this? Everything just feels like it's aged. Yeah. <laughs> and so you get this like stuff like I, I owned a 2010 Porsche Panamera in maybe 2018 so it was like an eight nine ten year old car when I owned it and you know you started to get all these like plastic tabs squeaking and things that it just don't fit over time and that's what this feels like except it's brand new now this particular car is 8400 miles on it which for a specialty car is quite a bit and it's a press car so it's been driven hard I just it feels very boutique to me feels very much like an Aston and um, that's a good thing or a bad thing I would say it just you know you buy an equivalently priced Porsche Audi Mercedes they're making millions of these with tons of engineers everything's just gonna fit a bit better so in terms of fit and finish I would say maybe a 4 out of 10 to be honest but in terms of functionality of space really not bad considering that this is your big battery pack I have plenty of headroom six foot one the seat does have a height adjustment, but it's only up and down. You can't rotate the seat up and down, like uh, tilt the bottom. So you pretty much are just up and down on the seat. Then the backrest can go forward and back and then lumbar in and out. You know, competing manufacturers in this pricing category have massaging seats. They have, you know, 19 way this and that, that, you know, lumbar, or I should say the side bolsters that come in and out. You're not gonna find that here. And uh, this is what happens when you go, like I said, with a boutique manufacturer where they're making maybe a thousand or two of these a year is my guess. And then, um, you know, you get an exclusive car that's really cool on the street, but you lose out on some of the practicality of every day. Really like this bezel-less uh, rear view mirror here. I think that's really nice. Quite large, quite towards the driver, but that's what you get with a raked windshield. I'm not sure what that garage door opener does. Under here, you get this quite squeaky uh, sort of uh, mirror, but at least they included one, uh, which is neat. And the <laughs> it does come to the side, but it doesn't pass the straight pipes mirror extension test. I'm sure I'll get copyright for using that. But all of these chrome tabs feel pretty high quality. It's like they tried to get the nicest materials they possibly could being a low volume manufacturer. And you get that sense. Lock and unlock of the doors. I have no idea. Oh yeah, it just lights up. So they're electronic locks because I don't hear any latches hazards and then this will open your glove box take a look and here is your glove box storage to close it needs a little bit of a good firm thunk we've learned 
You have your window control switches here in the center with your child lock uh, separate control right here. So that works. Express up and down. <laughs> you can also tell just from the window motors that they, they just you know got these from some supplier because they just go up and down really quick. Um, you can see how quickly they change direction. When you have a window inside of a Porsche, Audi, Volkswagen, a Mercedes, a Volvo, uh, a Jag, for example, uh, they have separate window control modules that regulate how quickly they go up and down and they speed up in and then they stop progressively and slowly. And here it's just up, down instantly. And this is, again, feeding into that boutique car experience. These are the things that I'm picking up on at least. Um, you have a couple controls in here which are really interesting. Paddle shifters on the steering wheel do not change gears, of course, because the three-cylinder engine is not mechanically connected to the wheels in any way. It just revs to charge a generator. So the paddle on the left changes your driving mode. There are three in total, indicated by these three stripes here on the, da on the paddle. And you have stealth, sustain, and sport. Sport turns on the combustion engine. Stealth runs... Uh, so what I, I'll walk you through. Stealth is like your EV pure electric driving experience. Sustain will hold your battery state of charge uh, with the combustion engine. And then sport mode will work the combustion engine with the electric motors to keep the battery topped up so you always have optimum performance. Basically, anytime you're driving in sport, uh, the engine is on. And we'll talk about that when we drive it. Then on the right panel, you have three levels of regen and uh, we're not in drive, so we can't adjust them, but basically regen one, two, and three. Uh, fairly strong regen on the strongest setting. I really like that. So regen here, drive mode on the left. And then you get this steering wheel, which is honestly feels like a Model S steering wheel rim with a different insert. So good wheel, I think, uh, easily accessible to your paddle shifters. The center bit's kind of neat. Um, and then you get this Karma logo here in the center. On the left side, We'll talk about this when we go into the infotainment, but basically on the right side, you get all of your adaptive cruise control uh, and lane centering. This car does have active lane centering and it works quite well on the highway. Uh, other than that, by my left knee, I have a couple controls. I have my trunk, my fuel cap, and my electronic parking brake. And I think that's kind of it for the inside. You know, could you fit four people in here? Absolutely, no question. Go to the golf club, go to the country club. That's what this is meant to do. But really, it's a two plus two uh, interior and uh, two people very comfortably going out uh, in this car will not be any problem whatsoever. Sound system also is fairly good, I have to say. Just kicking on my air conditioned seat and lowering the fan for our drive. These are This is how we go into different gears. So D, you know, drive, neutral, reverse. Interestingly, it always goes to neutral before it does anything. You can see it takes a second. I don't know if it comes up on camera, but when I hit park, it goes park, neutral, then reverse. And then from reverse, it'll go neutral. Oh, reverse just goes to drive. Interesting. We're in drive. We're in stealth mode with the regen on three. This is the most electric-like driving experience. Now, keep in mind, this particular one is the plug-in hybrid, or I should say the range extended EV. Uh, but soon, in just a couple months, by the end of this year, 2021, this car will have a full battery electric version. It'll be the GSE-6. Um, and I'm not sure if you should pronounce the dash. I just think it's so funny that that's the name. It's probably just GS6 is how they call it. But I think that's not a good name for this car is my opinion. So you should just call it the GS6. Uh, so that's a Toyota Mirai fuel cell. We have another Karma here going through the employee lot. Mustang GT with an exhaust. Enthusiasts here for sure. That's good. I like to see when people at car companies drive interesting cars. It means they're into this stuff. Uh, so driving around in stealth mode is, again, the most electric-like driving experience. Uh, if you were to tell me this is a full battery electric car, I would totally believe you. Again, rear-wheel drive only. Steering is extremely light, and it is a correct ratio. The car is quite long, so you kind of have to get the nose out and then make your turn. And it does a pretty good job at that, i got to say. Great turning radius uh, when you do crank the wheel over. So... Again, light steering, it's cool. One pedal like it driving. I haven't touched the brake pedal yet throughout this drive. Let's see if it brings you all the way to a stop. Does not, brings you to about five. And now it's just kind of coasting. Let's accelerate on. Let's go wide open throttle in stealth mode. Oh, moves pretty good, gotta say. 
This thing makes over 530 horsepower and 550 pound-feet of torque when you dial it up into its sportiest setting. I don't know what it makes here in the stealth mode, but I would imagine at least 70% of that because you just put your foot down and it boogies along just fine, have to say. This thing definitely, <laughs> definitely moves. It gives you the EV like instant torque and quite a lot of it. Just <laughs> Definitely moves. Changing our drive mode up to the next one, we're going to sustain. What sustain will do is it's now kicked on the combustion engine. We'll kind of just sustain our battery pack percentage. We'll write it about 50% state of charge. You can see here, engine is below operating temperature and warming up. You get a little you know, blue indication. Now I have a ton of gauges that I can go into and uh, we can go over here into engine and then I can see my engine temperature. Oil temps at 131, coolant's at 150 and it's gonna be rapidly heating up. Um, I'll take you through all of the gauges but it is truly in stain. So driving around in sustain mode, it's basically keeping the engine uh, with its generator, kind of holding our battery pack. The car estimates about 36 miles of range remaining. I think it says close to 90 miles of range on a full charge of battery electric. And then you can choose to, you know, level two or DC fast charge your battery pack and then move on. Uh, in terms of ride and comfort, we're over, you know, a pretty harsh highway uh, concrete path there and it's comfortable for being as low to the ground as it is and with 22 inch wheels on the sedan think about that for a second there was a day back when when the escalades were coming out when people would put them on 22s and like that was like almost a donk now we have 22s on sedans that's crazy uh, the the ride is is extremely supple and really nice actually so I'm impressed with how comfortable this is. This is a car you get in, you go to the you know coffee shop in, and then when someone tries to drag you at the lights, you put your foot down and blow them away. <laughs> it is staggeringly quick for being as comfortable as it is. It's not meant to be a performance car. It's not meant to go up a back road and shred around. It's meant to be a design exercise and driving it. Man, do you just feel so cool in this thing. Look, I got my elbow on the door, feeling comfortable already. So now that the engine temperature is out of cold, you can see we're coming up off the bottom and the blue indication has gone away. I'm gonna switch us into sport mode. And what sport mode will do is it will unlock the full power potential. Now we're still only powered by those two electric motors on the rear axle, totally independently connected like I mentioned. But now we have our fully unlocked over 500 horsepower. Let's see what that feels like. Actually, I think we should do a full launch. So I'll come to a stop over here in this empty business district. Literally no one's on the road. And we'll come to a stop. Left foot hard on the brake, flooring it with the right. Engine starting up, launch control starting, launch mode ready, go. <laughs> Spinning the tires. Oh, it's quick. 60. So 4.74 seconds to 60 there. We pulled just about 0.7 Gs on the launch. Look, this is quick for being a design exercise and just rear wheel drive. Really, we are at the limit of adhesion off the line. It's a heavy car and 4.7, you know, it doesn't sound fast, you know, cause we have Model S Plaid that's doing 1.9 with rollout on VHT. Let's just say very low two second range. Model S Plaid, Tycon, very low two second range. And, and 4.7 still gets you moving just fine, I think. <laughs> and especially this sort of mid-range, when I'm at 45 miles an hour, I put my foot down, it's instant, engine kicks on. Whoa! It definitely moves. We got our little over-speed warning sent by Fisker. Thank you very much. Or, excuse me, you can't say Fisker. Set by Karma. I keep wanting to call this a Fisker Karma. But since I brought up and misspoke and mentioned Fisker, let's talk about what that older car was like with that GM Ecotech. It had a similar concept of being a range extended EV. It was just garbage. Uh, that engine was really loud and had very agricultural like. Here, this thing sounds good under load. You really don't hear it in normal operation. When you drive around in sustain mode, for example, the, this engine operates in the background. It's quiet makes, and it's off right now. It's comfortable, like you don't hear it. When you put it in sport mode though, and you give it the full beans, it sounds good actually. Oh, we even got a little backfire there, a little pop pop out the exhaust, that's awesome. Um, 
but it, it's not like uh, an engaging driving experience. It doesn't encourage you to put your foot down from a noise perspective. I'd say the noise is well tuned for launches and stuff. Oh, we have a prototype going over here on the left. Wonder what that could be. Kind of looks like, I don't even know. Anyway, um, you know, how would I drive this car around? For the most part, in stealth mode with regen on full, driving it comfortably around town, looking cool, feeling cool. That's what this car is intended for. And doing that, all of the, you know, weird interior materials and squeaks and stuff, they don't really become apparent. And again, that could be just this particular car. I'm sure if you bought a brand new one, it wouldn't squeak or rattle. I just have to mention it because this car does have rattles and it's what we're only able to experience. It's a cool car. It drives really nice. It's comfortable. And uh, let's get it out on the highway, actually, and talk about driver assistance. Okay, we're behind another really special car, an E63 S AMG wagon. Very cool car for sure. And uh, good. Let's get stuck at this light here for a second. What I want to see is, does this car have creep mode? So we'll come all the way to a stop. It does creep forwards. No auto hold. So I come to a stop here, brake pedal in. Yeah, so no auto hold and it does creep forwards. I will say though, the motor calibration at low speed like this, really good, not even a hint of motor cogging. And they had to do two separate motors like that. Pretty impressive motor calibration and drivetrain calibration altogether with this engine and the battery pack. I've put this car in some weird situations in dynamic driving and you know, sort of around town driving and it's done well. But now we're in electric mode. We're running down the battery pack because we're going to a DC fast charging station because I want to see how quickly this thing charges uh, it, just in terms of peak kilowatt speed. So let's get the battery down. I can pull up my EV information here and I can see our battery is at 46 and a half percent state of charge and our temperature is nice and toasty, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which means when we arrive there, we'll be able to charge quickly. And let's talk about the difference between a battery electric, a plug-in hybrid, and a range extended EV. The battery electric is pretty self-explanatory. It's just a high voltage battery that powers the car. Think Tesla, think, you know, uh, really Jag I-Pace, Audi e-tron, Kona electric, any battery electric vehicle, and that works, and you can run electricity only. A lot of people buy plug-in hybrids because they, they have range anxiety. They want to have you know, electric driving with charging at home, but they don't want to ever have to rely on public charging networks, and they just purely drive uh, you know, electric until their battery runs out after 20 miles or something like this, and then that's it. Let's go into sport mode, launching it. Launch control, ready, go! <laughs> Five seconds zero to 60 that time pretty good on the brakes hard brakes seem to work well and a little drink spillage are we good yeah i guess the range extended ev is a different proposition than a plug-in hybrid i actually own a range extended ev i own an i3 range extender and basically it works as a full battery electric vehicle every day and then if i happen to drive more than the 80 or 90 miles that this car or my i3 can take me well then it just kicks on the combustion engine and i'm driving it like a normal gas car at least in the i3 performance is degraded when i'm running just on the uh, combustion engine because that works the same way as this it charges the high voltage battery which then powers the motors the i3's motor is really underpowered and especially where I live in Colorado, going up steep mountain grades, I can run out of electricity because the uh, combustion engine can't keep up. Here though, with a turbocharged 1.5 liter three cylinder, I don't expect that to happen. This is a pretty stout engine. I think you're just gonna drive it like a normal gas car. Let's try some driver assistance. So cruise control enabled, speed is set, lane keeping is on, and our distance is close. So now we have the closest setting with the lanes being detected by the vehicle. I'm just gonna move over one lane. And let's set our maximum speed up to, I don't know, 70 miles an hour, something like that. So now it is doing adaptive cruise. Look at that, pretty good, have to say. And now it's steering for us. I can see this because the car has gone blue in the instrument cluster. Oh wait, it's not actually steering. So when it goes blue, it means if you hit a line, it'll push you back in. To do active steering though, lane keeping enabled it was doing it for me earlier you get a little steering wheel here in the display and then it actively steers just fine what's up Alyssa it said it's only featured over 45 miles per hour oh really well th this is why we have you in the car with us so over 45 it will do lane centering 
and that worked really well here we're in traffic so i can't demonstrate that but kind of works the same kept me in the lines going down a highway actually a twisty portion kind of jiggled the wheel when it asked me to and it was good now i always do my driver assistance test to see what happens if i don't touch the wheel does it yank on the seat belt does it slam on the brakes like the audis do what does it do to get my attention well it wasn't very good in that department it just gave me a ding and then just shut off and then we were going off the road so uh, you know, while you should never use that system in a way where you're not paying attention or anything like this, I do think it's important to wake your, got to hit the plus button, even though there is no plus button, it's an up arrow. Again, sometimes the software and the actual buttons don't talk to me, you know, don't match up in these low volume cars, which is funny. Um, you know, while you shouldn't sleep while you're using lane centering, you could have a medical emergency and the car needs to wake you up and come to a stop. The ID4 I think is really good in this category. Slams on the brakes, honks the horn, puts the flash flashers on. That's a really good system. This could use some improvements there, I think. Overall though, highway, we had it up 80, 85, 90 miles an hour earlier today. It's quiet, comfortable, track straight. Can't get over how comfortable it is for the, the wheel size and how low it is. Let's run over to the charging station now that we're just sitting on adaptive cruise control just over here and see how DC charges. Welcome to the Electrify America charging station. I pre-activated this charger with my account. Let's plug it into the DC fast charging port. In we go. So DC fast charging a car. Do you do this with range extended hybrids? It's hard to say. Should plug-in hybrids have, pl have DC fast charging ports? My short answer is no. Should range extended EVs? Well, with this must range 80, 90 miles, sure, because what if you just want to run it in Target? You can continue driving on electric for a significant period of time. But what it comes down to is, does it charge fast enough to utilize the CCS ports or are we clogging up this station for not much benefit? So let's take a look. Come with me over here. 31 cents a kilowatt hour. I can tell it's not charging that fast because I don't hear cable cooling kicking on here. And uh, we want to continue, let this screen, sometimes they're a little laggy. Thank you for choosing Electrify America, you're welcome. We do this on all of our road trips, 33 kilowatts at 39%. Well, hey, that's not too bad. You know, our i3 will do about 50 kilowatts at this state of charge, and that's a smaller battery pack. So, you know, for a plug-in hybrid, I think 33 kilowatts is enough to justify having a CCS charger. Now we're down to 32 at uh, 23%, or sorry, 39%, 40%, but I wouldn't really go out of my way to DC charge this, but at least it's nice to know that it does. And thanks to a view of our channel, Edmund, he brought his Tycon 4S over here. Actually, he was here while charging, came up to say hi, and he offered to park the car next to the Karma, so now we can get an idea of the length. And honestly, it's not too dissimilar. They're sort of about the same length. You know, the Karma, I think, styling really makes it seem like a much longer car than it actually is. And I think the interior compartment suffers for the design, whereas the Taycan definitely has a bit more interior room. But uh, yeah, the external profile here, roughly the same. They look good. Karma's definitely a bit wider though. Which would you go for? Comment below. Would you go full battery electric with the Taycan or range extended EV and arguably better styling here with the Karma? Personally, I think I'm a Taycan guy. This thing is just one of my favorite cars on sale. But I think if you're buying a Karma, you probably already have one of these in the garage. What a cool comparison. Well, we stopped into Target. Alyssa didn't want a bag for some reason. <laughs> And uh, oh, it's in California, you gotta pay for bags. So we brought our $100,000 Karma Rivera, oh, no, Karma GS-6L, and you don't wanna pay the 10 cents for a bag. No, <laughs> save the planet. On principle, saving the planet. Okay, well, let's take a look at our charging stats. We were in there for some amount of time. I do know we're charged up to 80%. 21 minutes, we went from 39 to 80%. It's still doing 35 kilowatts, so not a hint of taper. That's interesting. We've added 12 kilowatt hours. So this is a good case for DC fast charging on a range extended EV. I would say that's pretty good range that we've added just for going into the store. Neat. Just gonna take you through some of the infotainment things on this car. So the way this all works is you have your driver instrument cluster and then your center screen. This center screen is capable of CarPlay, by the way, which is awesome. But for now, let's focus right here. So a couple buttons here on the steering wheel. You have volume up and down, that's these two. You have your music selection. 
where you have your phone call and voice command which activates uh, Siri right on your phone. Inside the instrument cluster, you can see we have 51 miles of projected range left, 325 miles factoring in fuel, and uh, everything across the bottom there. Let's go back over here to this little menu button, which then we can do a couple things with. Let me buckle up and that will make this menu go away. This little button here will run through a couple different things. You can first change the theme if you wanna have a driver assistance theme, a power theme, or one other theme that just says loading. Not sure what it does, to be honest. Oh, it said something about weather, I think. Hold on, let's take a look. I hadn't given it enough time to get past weather. Uh, loading. Yeah, it says something about where we are, I guess. Okay, that's kind of neat. Anyway, I think we'll put it back to the power one. Then I can click this gauge over here again and go through gauges, that button over there, and we get like engine RPM and a G meter and a high voltage discharge buffer. This is an interesting one. This is like how long can it sustain full power before it starts to limit and it needs to charge up the voltage in the battery pack again to get more voltage so you can pull more current. I think that's kind of neat as well. Then we gotta click this again, go back through the gauges, uh, state of charge, engine temperature, generator power, torque, power to the wheels, engine RPM, and then we cycle back through everything. That's kinda cool. Then I can click this again and bring up something that shows camera view. Then when I cycle through, this same button right here is controlling all of the different camera views on this screen, which I think you can also do by clicking this camera. I'm not quite sure, 360 view, you can move all around, that's kind of cool. Yeah, then you can just go through everything here. So that's kind of cool. Uh, that's everything on the left side, you get your volume phone calls in Siri, volume up and down, of course, and then on the right side, this is all your adaptive cruise control stuff that I showed you, and so that's everything for the the driver instrument cluster. When you drive the car around and drive, you get a gauge that goes up in the center that shows power output, and then regen comes up on the right side. So you get power output on the left, regen on the right. And that seems to work pretty well. A lot of different angles and weird uh, looking graphics, but I think it looks great and it's kind of neat. Back into park. Now we get this instrument cluster here, which is pretty interesting. It's broken up into a few different bits. I don't know if I mentioned, but it does CarPlay and it does full screen CarPlay and it's pretty pretty neat in CarPlay. First off, you get these hotkeys for things on the bottom that you're gonna need access to. For example, your mirror controls, which sort of emulate like hard buttons. And you can see the mirror moving over here as I adjust the buttons here on the screen. That's kind of cool. You can also fold the mirrors in. That's cool. And you can decide whether you want the mirrors to dip down in reverse and to where you want their position to be. That's a great feature and it seems to be great and then you can save everything. Then you get your, your seat controls here so we can go when I touch this, sort of cold, hot, heated steering wheel, hot or cold for the passenger. We have both seats on full cold. You can have windshield defrost, rear window defrost, and then bring you through that camera view I showed you earlier. These are kind of hard to touch. You kind of have to get like the pad of your finger on it. So I'm not sure which way to approach hitting these buttons. But if you just hit them normally, I run into them with the tip of my finger and it doesn't actually pick anything up. You kind of have to like angle, I don't know, hit it with your thumb maybe. Uh, there we go. Yeah, not sure. That's pretty difficult to get to. Then it's broken up into one, two, three, four, five different menus. This is going to be quite a long section, but I think it's so neat how much information it shows you. We'll first start with the electric stuff. We'll let this load up. It takes a couple seconds for it to load all the data. All right, well, I've tried turning the car on and off and doing all these things. Basically, this is a real-time menu that shows you like kilowatt output, and it looks really cool, but not life-changing. Anyway, then you get to your music. You can choose off, FM, uh, regular radio, I guess, or uh bluetooth yeah normally you can do bluetooth but i guess our phone isn't connected i have no idea what this is karma 950 to turn the music down you have to first select this and then hold this button down again at a weird angle and then you can i guess also just hit mute um i don't like buttons that you have to th hit first and then select the volume but in this one you do okay so that's your music then you have your phone calls, right? So we had Alyssa's phone connected. It's not connected anymore, uh, but it just works like a normal phone. And for the most part, you're gonna use Apple CarPlay. To hook up Apple CarPlay, you hook into this cable here in the center console. It is not wireless. And then you get your vehicle stuff here, which is cool. So you get messages, no issues. 
service check. We're good. It says oil level's okay. We get our settings, which is awesome. So you can set your seat settings. You can do easy entry. You can precondition, uh, I guess, for everything. I don't know. Uh, preconditioning target, automatic heated seats, automatic ventilated seats, passive unlock. Uh, let's see, all of these are just normal door locks. We get lighting controls here, which is cool. High beam assist, that's nice. Let's see, safety warning sounds. This is all of your safety stuff. Uh, rear camera on turn signal, that seems like an interesting one. So now if that's on, I hit turn signal. Uh, let's put it in drive. There we go, rear camera comes up on turn signal. That could be kind of helpful. Um, I think what I'll do though is I'll turn that off to not freak the next person out. Let's see, a whole bunch of other stuff. Wheel size, speed warnings, cruise control is adaptive, of course. Oh, here's our pedals. So we have a uh, sport pedal. Oh, this is for each of the driving modes. Okay, steering, what are your options? You have normal and sporty. It doesn't even say sport, it's just sporty that's quite interesting um haptic feedback haptic master okay temperatures yeah this is just like sort of all of our uh, stuff active noise control canceling engine noise that could be kind of interesting we'll have to play around with that when we can spend more time with this car um yeah and then you get you know valet mode blah 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 okay cool well that's that's a lot of stuff but now strap in because we're going to go through all of the gauges look at this these are all of the different menus of gauges you can choose from i've never had a car give us more data i'm just going to run through them all really quickly but i was just i mean Alyssa can attest to it was i not freaking out when it came on mm -hmm. yeah let's go into performance and so here we have all of our engine rpm motor temperature left and right regen oil temp awesome stuff next up dynamics here we have steering input in terms of weight we have driver demand i don't even know what i would be demanding we have power to the wheels axle torque requested braking as i push harder on you can see more pound feet um yaw rate compass neat Let's go to EV. So this should give us all of our electrical stuff. Yeah, we have our coolant temperature, trying to cool down the battery pack at 82 degrees. We have our cell voltage. We have our current. We have state of charge. We have battery 12 volt uh, um, uh, amperage right there. We have our watt hour per mile. I was doing launches in zero to 60, so it's really bad. Don't listen to that. I've just been ripping on it. Our charge buffer, discharge buffer. How cool is this? Next up, we have Hill Climb. This is so wild. This is like set up for Pikes Peak right here. Driver Demand. I guess that's Accelerator Pedal. Yeah, so that's floored 100% Driver Demand. That's what that stands for. Air Pressure, our Climb Rate, our Altitude, Mechanical Braking of Actual Force being requested, or actually that's going on the wheels. This is Mechanical Braking to the wheels. That's Pedal to the Floor. And that's rolling into it, so it won't be as strong as when we're moving. Um... That's pretty cool. HVAC. What on earth can it tell us about our HVAC? Our power, HVAC pressure, high voltage coolant loop temperature, high voltage temperature. <laughs> That's kind of cool. Next up, navigation. So compass, steering input, G meter, yaw rate, altitude, climb rate. Okay, well, that's kind of the same stuff as before. Various, this is so wild. Take a look at this. We have our pressure at sea level, our current air pressure out here. So we're very close to sea level. That would be wildly different in Colorado, of course. We have Bluetooth signal, our GPS signal, LTE signal, radio signal. How about that? Let's go up here, launch mode. So this will tell us our generator power, coolant temp, you know, basically everything before just laid out for what you're doing with the car. Let's go into engine oil temp, tank level of fuel, I guess. Uh, instant MPG, engine RPM, coolant temp. Okay. Um, hyper miler. <laughs> so this is everything you need to eke out every last drop. So like when I'm doing range testing, I can do this and take a look at my state of charge and my watt hour per mile and everything like that. That's pretty cool thermo so this is all of our temperatures of everything 
coolant temp, oil temp, high voltage temp, high voltage coolant. So this is your battery temperature average and your coolant temperature probably on the inlet to the battery pack. You have your inverter temperatures. That's pretty cool because again, two motors, you have two inverters, you have two generate, uh, two motors, of course, your inverter generator. That's for the motor up front, your generator temperature. That's cool. Ride comfort would be the last one. And this is basically your longitudinal <laughs> acceleration, uh, requested braking. That's kind of cool. Yaw rate. I believe this is for lane keeping, how much percentage of steering that it's wanting and then how much it's actually doing. So neat. And there you have all of the crazy gauges in the Karma GS6. And there you have it, folks, the Karma GS6L, or as I like to say, the GS dash 6L. I just think it's such a silly name as mentioned. Now, in summary, this is such an interesting car. If you want to stand out, have something unique, something very comfortable to peter around town in, mostly electric, go on a long distance trip using that combustion engine, I think this is a great car for that. The thing is though, if you appreciate really high quality engineering, fit and finish, well thought out user experiences, I don't think that this is the car for you. It really, you know, you can tell they're a small automaker trying to build this car, buying off the shelf components from whatever suppliers they can. They can't go and design, here's everything we want and then have everyone make those components. They're just not high volume enough. So you're, they're kind of left with little bits and bobs that are on the market. You can tell it's not a holistic package on the inside. This part comes from that company. This one's from here. Oh, I remember seeing that indicator stock from that other automaker. And it just feels a bit awkward in there. So the best way I can describe this car is it kind of feels like a 15 year old Aston Martin repeat on the inside with a way juiced up BMW i3 drivetrain, but yet looks like a villain's car and gets all the attention. So if you're into weird cars, then this is by far the coolest car you can buy. The Karma GS-6L should be named something like El Diablo. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching another Auto Spec Reviews video. See you on the next one.